Um, as you guys very well know, what one hot button topic for us every year that we certainly have to uh, to have to prepare for are, are, are some of our player safety initiatives, and specifically that revolves around uh, sports concussions. Um, something that we need to need to prepare for every season, and um, need to make sure that all of our coaches um, and, and and active volunteers are all prepared accordingly. So, a couple of housekeeping notes for you: if you go to our our Maha website under the player safety section, um, there is a presentation on sports concussions and, and our protocols from a USA hockey level. We are, as an affiliate of USA hockey, we are required to have a sports concussion protocol in place to, to address those uh, specific issues. And, you know, according to the Michigan sports concussion laws, which are summarized in that presentation, um, one of the things we we need to do is make sure that all of our, our coaches and participants and volunteers um, uh, take play, take part in a, a free online um, concussion certification course. You can go to the CDC website to to fulfill that step. Um, but uh, you know as, as part of our recently uh, acquired partnership with Henry Ford Health System, which we're incredibly proud to have, um, we are we are excited because it's it's um, it's given us access to some great resources, great content, as well as um, you know as, as well as some some great panelists and, and speakers. And so I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to our, our special guest today, who's going to talk to us a little bit about um, concussions. Who's he's kind of a, a, a well-renowned expert and, and pioneer in this field. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Kutcher is here with us. Um, he is with the Kutcher Clinic, which is formerly the Sports Neurology Clinic. Um, he's an internationally recognized expert and sports neurology pioneer. Um, he has founded the sports neurology section of the American Academy of Neurology. Uh, he, he is also a team physician for the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association and served as the team neurologist for the U.S. Olympic team in, in, uh, in uh, 2014 and 2018 uh, during the Winter Games. He serves as the director of uh, the NBA concussion program. He is also an advisor to the NFL Players Association as well as the National Hockey League Players Association. So uh, we are extremely lucky to have him here today. I know his time is uh, is limited with the football season starting up and things of that sort. So Dr. Kutcher, I, I sincerely appreciate your time today and um, your patience with my relentless emails to, to get you confirmed okay. or not. But, uh, you know, we're, we're really excited to have you. We're excited about this partnership with Henry Ford Health System and uh, the, the opportunity to have you participate with our first leadership seminar is a, is a, is a big deal to us. So welcome. Thank you. And I'll, I'll stop talking. You can share your screen and uh, we'll take it away, sir. Will do. I'll say one thing. Uh, in addition to all that stuff you mentioned that I do, uh, maybe more importantly, I grew up playing youth hockey. Here in Michigan, so uh, this is sort of full circle for me to help you guys out. Um, super honored to be doing this. Uh, let me share my screen. You know, I think um, what I wanted to spend some time with this morning. And can you guys see my slides? Yes, sir. Looking good. All right. Well, let me get that. Uh, come on. There we go. So, um, as Jason mentioned, hold on. It got ahead of me here. Well, I'm, sorry. Um, I'm a neurologist, I'm a sports neurologist. And what that means is I do more than concussion. I do the whole breadth of neurology as it applies to athletes. And one of the things that um, if we stop and think about why we are even here today, and I'm speaking to you about concussion, you know, everything changed in about 2008. Um, and most of you probably remember like concussion was something that maybe we knew about a little bit, but nobody really cared about it. It kind of happened and it was, you know, whatever. And then really, Virtually overnight, it was the fall of 2008, everything changed. Uh, and all of a sudden sports had to take this issue incredibly seriously. Um, and and I, I can't, there's not another injury in sports that is treated this way. There aren't ACL laws and, and shoulder protocols and all these other things, right? Um, but the thing I want you to realize is going back to 2008, uh, there was no medical discovery. There, there was no like, oh wait, this is concussion. We figured out what that is. Uh, or even CTE or any of that stuff. We, we've known about this for decades and centuries, frankly. Um, what was discovered in 2008 was a legal risk. That was what was discovered. And sports in, in sort of uh, uh, response to that had to create this whole 
system of protocols and, and, and things. And, you know, as a physician and as a former hockey player, I, you know, we are much better off today than we were pre-2008. Don't get me wrong. Uh, we, you know, injuries are important. These injuries are incredibly important. Brain health is the most important health there is. However, um, at speaking to you as somebody who has written a lot of concussion policies and protocols at every level, I can tell you that these are legal protocols more than they are medical. So yes, um, the USA hockey protocols are incredibly important to follow and be aware of. Uh, but what I wanted to spend some time today is to give you kind of the medical foundation uh, and a little bit more information behind the scenes, behind the curtain, if you will, as it relates to how we deal with, um, with concussion. Um, the first thing I wanna point out, right, is we use the term concussion a lot. It, it uh, probably in the general media, and I would say even in the medical, world, it's used incorrectly more often than correctly. Concussion has a very specific diagnosis uh, that then gets ignored. Um, if this is, you know, somebody's career, somebody's life, you know, and, and their sports career tends to be, you know, sort of in the first part of their life, concussion is a transient injury, a physiological state brought on by force. The brain cannot operate efficiently, electrically, it cannot form networks. When we study this process, and we, we know it very, very well down to the ion concentration changes and all kinds of things, it is transient. It goes away every single time, end of story. Um, so concussion, if you, if you hear people say, oh, you know, I'm dealing with my concussion problems when I played, you know, back when I played hockey, or he's been out with, or he or she has been out of sports for six or eight months with concussion, that's absolutely incorrect. Concussion lasts a week, maybe two, when we look at the actual physiological injury. However, there's this other thing called post-concussion syndrome, PCS for short, which is a term, frankly, that was made up um, mainly by insurance companies to help with billing. Uh, it's, it's not a really well-defined medical uh, pathology kind of a concept. It really is a syndrome in the truest sense, which medically means common symptoms from multiple causes. Um, and PCS can last weeks and months or even years. And it's one of the things we see in our clinic all the time. Uh, people who uh, sort of had a concussion, uh, symptoms outlive the injury itself. Um, and that's an important point, right? Post-concussion syndrome is not post, I've hit my head, I'm having a long concussion syndrome. It's post-concussion, the concussion's over, the injury's over itself, and you're having symptoms for other reasons. Identifying those reasons are incredibly important, and we'll cover that later in the talk. But then the third sort of aspect of, of brain health um, in, in athletes is the long-term stuff, right? Um, and as you'll note, I don't consider myself a concussion doctor and I don't run a concussion clinic. Uh, I'm a sports neurologist. I deal with athlete brain health, the totality of athlete brain health. And long-term changes can occur with repetitive hits over time, uh, but that's a different line of pathology altogether than concussion. So I wanted to set this kind of three-phase stage uh, concept up for you guys that you know, in real time, when you're, you're coaching and you're running leagues and you're dealing with, you know, injuries during games and practices, that's a concussion concept. Um, but these other two things are there. They're very real. We have to deal with them. Um, but, you know, nobody's come up with a post-concussion syndrome protocol <laughs> that, that is overly simple. So let's talk about concussion. Um, what is it? I mentioned, you know, it occurs in the brain experiences force. Um, and, and in quite, quite simply, think of it as a software injury. It is an injury of function, not structure. So basically, brains work by forming networks, billions of neurons talking to each other all the time, forming electrical networks. Uh, in the concussed state, that formation becomes inefficient, right? As I mentioned before, it is temporary. Uh, concussions do not require a loss of consciousness. That was a sort of an older concept that, you know, every once in a while you still hear that, but certainly do not need a loss of consciousness to be concussed. And frankly, it's maybe less than 10% of those injuries that involve loss of consciousness. And concussions can affect a wide variety of, um, of brain function. Um, so think of it really as a network injury, meaning um, it's not like a stroke or a tumor or, or a bruise or a focal, like there's a piece of my brain that was concussed. It's the entire brain is inefficient. I think of it, one analogy is kind of like Google Maps, right? Here's Toronto on a, well, anymore, maybe that's not Toronto, but maybe it's Toronto on an early Sunday morning <laughs> versus Manhattan uh, anytime. And, and the idea is, you know, the, the roads are there, the highways are there, the information is just not flowing around like it should. But the other important thing to realize, and you may already get this concept 
from uh, your, your own lives, your, maybe your own injuries or your kids or your players. Uh, concussion is a projection of the injury. But what I mean by that is what symptoms are produced, what clinical things you see as a coach or I see as a doctor is more an effect of that brain that went into the corner and got hit than it is the hit happening to the human brain. In other words, you go into the corner with a predisposition for attention issues or mood issues or migraine issues or neck issues or sleep problems or whatever it is, those are the things that are going to be predominantly presenting in the concussed state. So in this simple sort of uh, cartoon analogy, you have an injury applying to one person, you're gonna get a certain amount of symptoms that last a certain amount of time, exact same injury, different person, different presentation, right? That's different than any other injury we deal with. If I have a hundred guys or girls who have an ACL injury, the, the exam is pretty much identical. The um, complaint is identical, but in concussion, that's not the case at all. And that, that's one of the things that makes my job and your job too, as, as stewards of, of this injury, uh, a little bit uh, slippery, I'll say, a little bit more difficult, but certainly knowing your players, knowing your kids uh, is incredibly important in recognizing these injuries. Let me uh, talk a, a moment about concussion management. And this is something that um, you probably also have seen evolution. And you know, before obviously 2008, it was okay, whatever, can you skate, get out there, go. Uh, then it turned into this, okay, you're concussed, I'm gonna pull you out, sit you, rest you, dark room, don't do anything until you feel better. That is, is as bad as the first way. And I'll explain why in, in a moment. Concussion management, which from a neurologist's perspective has never really changed. It's just that uh, we weren't involved when, when sports kind of jumped into the fray and tried to make these very simple protocols. Concussion management really should be uh, divided into three phases, right? There's what we call acute rest, relative rest, and then graduated exertion. Now acute rest, just what it sounds like, um, I want you to do as little as possible. I want you to kind of shut it down. Um, but the trick to that is I'm never going to prescribe that to somebody unless that's all they want to do. Meaning they feel so crappy, all they want to do is go in a dark room and lay on a couch. Um, I'm never going to take somebody who I've diagnosed with concussion who, yep, has a headache, you know, dizziness, light sensitivity, but yeah, they could watch you know, a game on TV or, or they could, you know, go to the store or take the dog for a walk, do that, right? So acute rest, that first phase, frankly, is something that we see maybe 25% of concussions. Symptoms are bad enough to make, you know, to have people like do nothing. Um, that second phase relative rest is where the majority of the first few days of concussion exist, um, which is to say you're doing relatively less than you would, right? So you're, you're, you're being physically active, you are cognitively engaged, you're doing some things in the environment, socially, whatever, um, but you're just not doing as much of it. You're not doing anything, obviously, that's any kind of contact risk or impact risk. And then the third phase, graduated exertion, which um, you may also you know, uh, kind of refer to as the return to play protocol, which I hate the word protocol if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, it's a process, it's a graduated exertion process. And the goal of that, right, is if the brain is still injured and not producing symptoms, we're going to expose uh, our patients to more and more controlled physical um, and cognitive challenges so that if that brain is injured, it will produce symptoms. Now, hockey is incredibly um, unique. A sport, obviously. Um, well, we we'll understand that. Um, one of the things that we have to be careful when we return our players from concussion in ice hockey is the complexity of the environment. I mean, think about what the brain has to do to get on a stationary bike and ride for 20 minutes. Very, very little, right? It's just kind of hanging out, responding to heart rate and blood pressure changes. We then add some intervals. Okay, now we're dealing with some you know, quick changes in, in, in pulse, but then we're gonna add you know, body weight, exercises off, off ice, dry land, kind of squats and lunges and moving around a little bit. And then we're gonna go skating. Um, and skating obviously is incredibly more cardiovascular challenging than I think people realize sometimes. But when we start exposing the patient to the hockey environment, by which I mean, how many people are on the ice? What is the drill? What's the complexity of the situation? Um, that, what, the, what you're asking the brain to do is just amping up uh, orders of magnitude more uh, than just doing a flow drill, right? Or just skating on your own or something like that. So in hockey, more than any other sport, we have to be cognizant of the return process as it relates to exposing people sequentially to more and more complex environments. Um, a couple of 
of uh, I wanted to cover really quick. Um, the first one is that, you know, any brain symptom after a hit must be a concussion. And that's kind of how sports has been kind of dealing with concussion the last few years. Um, frankly, it's very simple to think about, you know, you go into a corner, you, your head hits the boards. Um, yeah, your brain experiences force, but so does everything else in your head. Um, and there are a lot of things in your head that cause symptoms that have nothing to do with your brain. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the, um, excuse me, as a matter of fact, the number one symptom in concussion as you would guess, the most common symptom is headache, right? Um, take a moment and realize that brains are absolutely completely without sensation. They are numb, you cannot feel them. So that means that even in concussion, the thing that, that is the most common thing we look for is not the brain itself uh, producing that symptom, it's the nerves in the head that are sensitive on purpose, right? So it's very, very common for somebody to you know, get a, a hit to the head irritate the nerves in the outside or the inside of the skull, create headache and a bunch of other symptoms without even injuring the brain, right? So what that means to me is, especially for your, your role, is yes, we wanna screen, uh, you know, and, and be aware of any symptoms that are produced after a hit, that's sort of, that's step one. And that should initiate a triage decision. Am I suspicious enough that I see a big hit I'm concerned, concussion may be there. So it's a triage decision for let's remove you uh, for your safety, get you evaluated by somebody who can, you know, have this conversation and figure out the correct diagnosis. That is different than a diagnostic decision. And that's something that, you know, whether I'm writing my, pro my protocol for the NBA or helping out the NHLPA or NFLPA or whatever, our role as physicians, athletic trainers, coaches, parents is not to diagnose concussion during a game. Absolutely not. It's to triage for safety, right? Let the diagnosis, let, let a physician figure that out the next day, two days later, three days later. Um, and that's super important because obviously I can't tell you how common, it's so common people come into our clinic. Oh, I've had three, I've had five. And you, and you start taking a history, you look at videos of hits, you're like, uh, no, that, that's a post-traumatic migraine. That's a neck injury. That's a laceration on your face that caused a headache. Like, um, so you have to be really, really careful and understanding there's more out there that's gonna cause symptoms than just concussions. So that's sort of myth number one. Myth number two is that concussions actually add up. They don't. Um, that was sort of a myth kind of propagated um, back in the you know, late 2000s to try and get people to change behavior really quick. You know? um, one does not make the next one easier to get. That's the third myth on this list. There's so many myths I could throw out here, but... Um, the second concussion isn't necessarily worse than the first one, all these things. Now, there are, like I said at the beginning of the talk, long-term consequences of repetitive hits, but that's not concussion. That's not repetitive concussions, right? So we have to be careful about how we use the term. Um, and let's, let's dovetail that with what is post-concussion syndrome, right? So like I said before, it is a group of symptoms or difficulties that continue after the concussion is over. We do recognize in these patients, and these are folks that you know, come to our clinic, like I said, anywhere two weeks, three weeks after a hit, uh, up to months or even years. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say for a moment that as a neurologist who does this, I wanna see patients as soon as possible. I wanna see them same day, next day after an injury so that I can prevent post-concussion syndrome from happening. Um, and you can, absolutely can if you know what you're doing. Um, the other thing is, you know, we have this idea that, you know, there's youth sports and high school sports and, you know, uh, college and pros and all that. And you would think that um, these problems are, are treated better in the professional ranks. I'll tell you uh, candidly that that's not the case. We have NHL players come to see us all the time who have been misdiagnosed um, and, and treated incorrectly. Um, Post-concussion syndrome cases are similar to each other, meaning there are some, some common threads between these presentations but each one is still unique. And, and just think about um, one of the more common things between one presentation and another is that in almost every case, the patient has been told to do very little or do nothing, um, as, you know, especially compared to what they did pre-injury. So you take a, any human, let alone an active human, let alone a, you know athletic hockey playing human and say, don't do anything. Um, you know, just that simple act without even being injured, don't do anything for a week or two. You can start creating symptoms in that person. Energy levels get weird, sleep gets off, anxiety goes up. If you've got a migraine family history, you're gonna start having headaches, so on and so forth. So 
there is this, this concept of, and we'll touch on this later, the um, unplug syndrome, take a human, tell them to do nothing, you're gonna create symptoms. That's the common thing in post-infection syndrome we see all the time. But some of the other unique variables would be things like migraine headache, neck injury, anxiety, ADHD, sleep problems, all these things are interacting with each other too and creating something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. So there is no one treatment for post-concussion syndrome. It is something that requires a very specific approach to every patient, but it is very treatable. Um, you know, there's this idea, and we see this all the time, people are told, oh, stop playing sports because you have headaches. Um, and my answer is stop your headaches so you can play sports. Um, I mean, in most cases, obviously, and I don't, I'm never gonna have a, a patient go back to playing contact sport if I think it's unsafe, but 99 times out of 100, um, these are problems that have nothing to do with brain trauma specifically, but you treat their, their symptoms, treat their problems, and they can go back to play. Graphically, um, this, and maybe this will just kind of hammer this point home, right? So this is this concussion curve that I've drawn here. Um, here's the force, the impact. This dotted line is, is that threshold above which you have symptoms from concussion, below which you don't. Um, Post-concussion syndrome will look kind of like this, right? get to no symptoms, but there's initial recovery that is then sort of this, you know, up and down kind of plateaued kind of concept of symptoms continuing in the future. And this could be four days, two weeks. Um, but the point is that as soon as the concussion itself is over, if there are symptoms that are continuing, we call that post-concussion syndrome. So with all that being said, I wanted to walk through a little bit of how we would approach a, uh, a typical patient, um, sort of the, the life the lifespan, if you will, of, of, of an athlete in, a, in our clinic. And the first concept is baseline testing, right? I'm sure you all have had some exposure to baseline testing, which is a great concept to measure brain function prior to an injury, to give us a sense of, okay, are you, are you different or not? It's easy to do, frankly, you put a team in a room, do some computer testing, so on and so forth. But the problem with baseline testing is it's not what people think it is. It's not diagnostic of anything. It's a measure of performance. How did you perform on that day uh, you know, Sunday afternoon at two when you, you know, were out late last night and didn't sleep well and um, you didn't eat breakfast yet and you have to go to the bathroom and you're distracted by your parents, whatever. Like all these things affect baseline testing. Um, it's not a diagnostic test. The results of baseline testing should be used to augment the neurological history and examination of the clinician who's going to be taking care of the patient. A brief segue into, and this is a paper that came out a couple of years ago. Um, the NCAA DOD Care Consortium, largest prospective, meaning going forward in time, sports concussion study in the world, um, thousands and thousands of, of uh, student athletes at 30 some institution, uh, NCAA institutions and service academies. Um, the reason I put this paper up here is they looked at the most common baseline testing modalities. Maybe you've heard of the impact test, maybe you've heard of the balance error scoring system and other tools. Um, their conclusion was, after looking at tens of thousands of these things over time, none of these meet the accepted reliability thresholds for clinical interpretation. Just think about that for a sec, right? Um, but that's what people do. And actually, in this paper later on in the discussion, the authors say, well, but we don't have anything better. I totally disagree with that. Um, and I would say that they probably said that because this study was paid for by the NCAA. Um, but the thing to do is actually, shockingly, practice medicine. Um, you take a history, and the history should be relevant to what kind of things may come up in a concussion evaluation, sure, but what are things that, are, that speak to that athlete's brain health, sleep, mood, uh, attention, headaches, all these things that not only make them a better hockey player, but they'll make them a better student, a better um, you know, friend, uh, family member, and all these things. And we, so we take a history that's focused, but you know, relevant, and we do a physical examination that again is relevant to if I'm gonna see you on the sideline or I'm gonna see you in my clinic, what are some things that I might pick up on exam when you're not injured and now I'm gonna have a better sense of what you're like when you're maybe injured. Um, and one of the things that, that I wanna point out here is when you take a history, um, neurological history, there's an art to it, uh, people love to have put a bit into these forms. And this is an example of the NHL modified scatter player I saw a few years ago. 
who, who came into our clinic and he'd been out for, I don't know, four or five weeks. And his athletic training staff had sent to me one of these forms that training room and they have him fill out this bubble form. He had one for every single day for four or five weeks or whatever. And that is a surefire way to get people to feel stuff. If you ask them to fill out one of these forms every single day, they're going to start feeling things. And towards the end, you can see what he was doing. He's like, oh, I, you know, neck pain, uh, I guess I'm a 0.5, whatever that is. You know, I, I scratched this out and, and it's zero and I don't know, maybe I'm a two or one point, I don't know. And one of his main complaints to me when he showed up to our clinic was, doc, I don't know what number I am. You're like, uh, that's, not, that's not helpful for anybody. So you take a history for us means talking to the patient, getting information that's clinically relevant. Um, doing our examination, this is just a, a, a example of the exam we've been doing with the US ski team for a while. But the point is you end up with this kind of information. This is a quick story I'll tell you. This is a very small local high school that we covered. Um, I'm holding up a piece of paper there. That, that rectangle is blocking out the, the, the player's names. Um, very small team, football team, 24 or so kids. What, what's listed there are all of the examination findings that we had at baseline. Now, they're not abnormalities. They're how they performed on a neurological test because neurological function is, is definitely variable from person to person. And you can see there's some 13 or so um, uh, of, the, of the 20, like half of the kids had some finding, right? I'm holding this up because uh, this is in the third quarter of the game. Back in the second quarter, we had a player, a linebacker, not really well known for his sense of control, kind of diving into the pile at the end of a play right in front of our bench. Um, you know, he's the last one to get up. He's kind of moaning, grabbing his neck. So he stabilizes his C-spine, clear that, make sure it's not a neck injury. Um, but he's clearly in some distress. He's not remembering what, really what's going on. So four minutes to go in the second quarter, we walk him to the locker room, start doing our evaluation. I find that his eye movements aren't great. He can't follow my finger uh, as, I, as I ask him to uh, follow the finger smoothly. Can't do that really well. He can't uh, do a test we commonly do of standing on one foot with your eyes closed and doing a little bit of a squat. He also can't remember the second quarter at all. Doesn't remember the play, uh, is a little bit confused, right? So you would think, okay, concussion, right? Well, he's the second one from the bottom on that list. That says saccades on pursuit. That's exactly what I found on the eye movement part. Saccades means you cannot smoothly pursue something with your eyes. Poor single leg couldn't squat. Turn that piece of paper over and there's a list of all of the exam or the, uh, the history findings. And uh, for him, history of anxiety disorder and panic attacks. His mother comes in the, the locker room after halftime and says, oh, this is what happens when he gets pain, he hyperventilates, uh, he has a panic attack, and th that causes this sort of mental status confusion. Completely different explanation for the presentation. Um, and that's helpful baseline testing, right? That, that's baseline testing that made a difference in this student athlete's life because we spared him a concussion diagnosis. Now, getting back to that triage decision versus diagnostic decision, did I let him go back in the game? No, because he still could have been concussed. I didn't know that until I spent more time with him, watched him over the course of the second half. We saw him after the game, we saw him the next day, never produced another symptom or, or difficulty. So no, we did not put him in the concussion protocol, despite the fact that he did not remember the second quarter of the game. Um, that is again, clinically useful information for baseline testing. We do that every season with every contact sport athlete. Um, another thing to think about, I mean, we do this in the summers, obviously more than other times of year. Every summer, uh, we pick up at least one, sometimes two, and at the most is maybe four per year of a student athlete um, who is actively suicidal. Uh, obviously it's a huge problem, right? Um, and just, so just asking the right questions in that setting. And yeah, that's four, four or five kids out of, I don't know, we do 700 or so a summer probably. But yeah, so we, we, you know, we can make a difference if we ask the right questions. Um, those are the kind of things that, that I would say is that, that's useful baseline testing. Um, let's touch back on concussion a sec. Here's, here's the network injury I mentioned before. I mentioned that not all brain pathology causes a clinical effect. But what, what I really want you to realize, um, if I took everybody on this call right now, right? And I gave you the same hit to the head or something happened to you. Um, injury will be created if that force is enough to cross what we call the injury threshold. Now, if I gave you all the same hit to the head, I'm going to get some fairly tight 
um, amount of in injury, meaning like there might be some variability from one person to the next, but it's not gonna be terribly different. Um, however, if I could magically put the ex exact same amount of injury into each of you, uh, I'm gonna create a, a different clinical outcome. Um, and the symptom threshold concept is what we kind of refer to in this scenario. So think about um, th this, this common situation that I get in clinic. Uh, a patient comes in with mom and dad, uh, I've had five concussions uh, or three or whatever. And you know, my parents don't want me to play hockey next year or you know, I'm not gonna go to college and play hockey or whatever the situation is. Um, and you talk to them and they've had five diagnosed concussions and everyone was, you know, pretty decent hit and it caused a two week, you know, kind of, kind of clinical syndrome um, versus the exact same person comes in, a clone of the same person who's had the exact same number of hits who says, doc, I have zero diagnosed concussions. Who am I more concerned about as it relates to long-term brain health? The answer is the second person. And the reason is if I have a lower clinical or symptom threshold, when I'm injured, I will produce symptoms. I will know it, my coach will know it, my parents will know it, my doctor will know it. If I have a higher symptom threshold, I'm getting the same injury, I'm having the same hits, my brain isn't producing symptoms, and therefore I've got zero concussions. I see this every year. I, I do a lot of work with the NFLPA, for example. Only we do a lot of combine work. Uh, running back side of running back from an SC school, SEC school this year, you know, four year or three year starting running back who had never been diagnosed with a concussion in the SEC. I'm like, eh, yeah, okay. I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> um, but he had a very high symptom threshold. The point is, people who don't produce symptoms are more likely to be playing injured. So that's just, I wanted to give you that kind of nuance because that's like, all right, you're telling me, doctor, that, that the number of concussions not only doesn't matter, but it may be helpful. And it, it can be in the right situation. Um, I already mentioned that these, these points, so I'll, I'll uh, move on, but um, a, a brief word on, on sort of the types of symptoms that develop in concussion. I already mentioned the headache is actually uh, a response of the nerves to the brain injury, but these are sort of the common ways we, uh, categories we define the symptoms in, you know, cognitive aspect of it, the physical aspect, the mood aspect, and the sleep. Um, however, Another way to look at this is uh, here is the concussion symptom checklist, right? This is on uh, the SCAT form. Um, I'm one of the authors of the SCAT form. I don't like the SCAT form, uh, frankly. Um, I'm one of the authors of it uh, because it's, it's meant to be used. I shouldn't say I don't like it. I, I don't like the way it's used, I should say. It's meant to be used as a screening tool in the field and to follow over time in the first couple of days. It's, but it's become something that people use in every situation. And I'm sure, you know, these are the symptoms that, that people fill out um, preseason and baseline testing, or if we think there have been an injury. Well, here is the, the migraine symptom checklist. It's identical. Um, here is your cervical symptom checklist. If I have a neck injury, a heck of a lot of these things. Here is your cranial nerve symptom checklist. If you injure a cranial nerve in a hit. So I just want, wanted to give everybody an example of, of you know, that that is much more to this than, than what we uh, sort of have boiled down into these protocol scenarios. And just to put this visually, if I'm seeing a patient, um, here's your impact. And this is what, you know, this is sort of the concussion curve, what we would expect it to look like. The majority of, of the symptoms and injury are kind of early on and kind of plateaus over time. Here's what even injury from a, from a neck would kind of be, be persistent and continue from a neck mechanism. Uh, here's maybe a migraine mechanism. Here's maybe, sleep, right? And you get the point that like a lot of things are going on. Um, and if we just say, hey, you're concussed, good luck. Um, that's where people end up missing weeks at a time. At the end of the day though, what this all means is that mechanism matters. Mechanism is something that I think people have been neglecting. Um, and in our own sport, um, frankly, the NHL's approach to mechanism has been a little off in my estimation, um, meaning it hasn't been really brought into the, the conversation like it should. Um, just as an example, here are some sports that I've covered over the years. Um, obviously football has its own set of unique mechanisms and every position is different as far as number of hits, degree of hits. Um, and so understanding that, yeah, you know, a lineman, a, you know, a, a left tackle uh, in, in, a, in a power offense is gonna have a lot more hits during the game, but those hits are gonna be lower in, in G4s than 
uh, you know, the linebackers who are flying around outside linebackers making high speed tackles and those kinds of things. So understanding what's going on with brains in each sport is super important. The diving example I use, um, because it's important to know when, when athletes are at risk of concussion, you know, in diving, it's not, it's not really competitions because they're pretty much dialed in. It's in, it's in practices and learning new dives. And so that's where you want to focus your, your medical care more from a concussion perspective is, in, is with the training aspects. Um, on the right there, uh, that's in Park City. That's one of our aerial skiers. Um, in Park City, we have, oh, I should have mentioned I have a clinic in Park City too, so I go back and forth. Um, in Park City, we have a, a pool that, that our aerialists jump into. Um, and, and one summer, I wanted to know, understand a little bit more about the forces that their brains are going through. So I put um, accelerometers on their mastoid processes behind their ear, right in their skull there, and we measured them for a while. Um, and it was, it was enlightening. Um, they were actually taking more G-forces than my foot. Um, and in the summer, they would do anywhere from like 10 to 12 jumps a day, four or five days a week um, uh, for, for several, several weeks, eight or nine weeks in the summer, even before they went on to snow. So, you know, you know, you don't think about it. Oh, we're jumping into a pool. I guess it's going to be super soft water. But at the end of the day, like understanding the forces that their brains were going through um, led us to change how they trained and, and how many times they jump and those kinds of things. So applying that to hockey, you know, I think it, 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 as experienced hockey people, um, you can watch a game and you can see a hit and you're like, oh yeah, that's a big hit versus that's a glancing blow versus that wasn't much of anything. Um, don't be afraid to use that. Don't be afraid to understand that symptoms can be created from bumps and hits and cuts and things that don't involve actually injuring the brain if, if the hit wasn't substantial. Um, is totally, I would say, um, not only relevant, but important to do that. And here's, here's just a video example of, of uh, two ski crashes. This is from um, uh, the Olympics in Korea. And I'll just play this uh, video. This is one of our, our GS skiers. Now she's probably going, I don't know, 30, 35 miles an hour or so. And she uh, overcooks a turn and kind of airplanes a little bit, smashes into a thing, runs over a shovel, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I'm at the, I'm in the starting gate. That's, that's where I go. Uh, then when one of my athletes goes down like this, I hop into the, out of the court. So I got to her maybe, uh, <laughs> I don't ski as fast as they do, um, minute and a half or so after she crashed, um, shook up, uh, a lot of adrenaline, um, neck pain, uh, and, and, you know, otherwise doing pretty well. And the question is, well, can she get, she had to do that. I think the slalom was the next day. Could she race tomorrow or whatever? Um, so compare that uh, to this crash, which, you know, maybe for the, for the non-skiing uh, population, would say, all right, it's kind of a similar crash. This is in Europe, uh, same season. Um, one of our downhill racers, now he's probably going 65, 70 when this happens. Same story though. And in this situation, I'm doing telehealth from the States, but I talked to him as athletic trainer maybe 10 minutes after this crash or so, and, or maybe a little bit longer than that, and same presentation. He shook up a little bit, he's got some neck pain, so on and so forth. So what is the difference between this hit, right? So you, you're this exposure to force uh, versus the other one. In this situation, just think about what the brain is doing. It's kind of flying through space and it's just kind of coming to a nice, except for that one little, but there's never really a big hit. Some little bumps here and there, but overall, the force is dissipated over several seconds, right? And compare that to this. I'm going to slow this down or stop it at a particular point. And it's going to be watch, as opposed to in a previous example, uh, she went up into the air because of a um, you know aerodynamic problem. Watch, watch why he actually launches himself into the air in this situation. It's his knee coming up and smashing him in the head. <laughs> right, uh, at an incredibly, incredibly fast speed, a ton of force. There is no way in the world I'm letting this person get back up in the starting gate of a, of a downhill ski run, whether he's got symptoms or not. Mechanism matters. And in the first case, she did not go on to have any symptoms at all. Um, we treated her neck strain. She competed the next day. In the second case, he went on later in the day to have incredible headaches and nausea, vomiting, disorientation. Um, and you know, we treated his concussion appropriately. So. Just some examples of, um, of, of uh, different mechanisms. I mentioned as we're going through these kind of 
you know, decisions. We see these hits, we're like, okay, well, is that concussion or not? Um, it's actually appropriate after that triage decision is made, and then we're dealing with next day in clinic, a couple of days later in clinic, we use terms like definite, probable, and possible concussion. And that's not to hedge bets or that's not to be coy. Uh, it's accurate, frankly. Um, there is no diagnostic test for concussion. You may see stories about blood tests and urine tests and these things, but that's absolutely not right. There is no di di diagnostic test for concussions. It's a clinical diagnosis that I make based on the mechanism of injury and the clinical effect. And I define this in three different categories. So a definite concussion obviously is the hit was big. Uh, the, the clinical syndrome was consistent. No other possible explanation, zero. It is concussion. As you can imagine though, um, the more you know about neurology in the brain, the more other things that can cause symptoms. And you get a situation where there's a hit that's you know big enough hit, uh, clinical syndrome that's consistent. You have other possible explanations post-traumatic migraine, cervical strain, other things, but concussion is on the top of the list. We call that probable. If there are other explanations um, that are more likely than concussion, but I don't have enough information to completely rule it out, we call it possible. And I say this because, you know, obviously in the definite or, or probable categories, we're gonna treat you like you're concussed, but in this possible concussion scenario, you don't really have to, and it really depends on the situation uh, the resources around that athlete and the family support and athletic training staff and all these things. Um, again, the whole point of that, what I wanted to get across in this talk is there's the protocol and then here's reality. Right? Reality is much more complicated than what people realize. Okay, a um, couple of quick things on post-concussion syndrome. Um, I'm sorry, I got a couple of repetitive uh, slides in here, so I'm just gonna go through those real quick here. Um, as I said, post-concussion syndrome, right, is this, this concept. Um, what I wanted to say here is, you know, once we identify all the different things that could be causing a post-concussion syndrome, we understand that it is a bigger sum than, than just the sum of its parts. Um, this is how we treat it. We say, all right, you know, you, you've got these different issues. Um, I have treatments for each of these things. This is not meant to be a complete list. This is sort of an example list, right? I wanna make sure as a physician, I'm treating each of these things, but I also wanna make sure that I'm treating them in such a way as to move the whole ball forward. Uh, Cause there are some things on this list, for example, how I would treat migraine could, me could make anxiety better or worse. How I treat sleep could make attention better or worse. Um, what kind of physical things I have the person go through and how we do that. All these things are incredibly complex. And what we end up with is here's an example of a patient from a few years ago as an NHL player. This is the return to sport concept from a post-concussion syndrome, which is, you know, the example here is just to let you know how complex it is. Um, but like I said before, completely treatable, get people back uh, and, they're, and they're good to go. Now, let's spend a second on this graphic that, I, that I've kind of introduced you guys a little bit and gone through quickly. So this is sort of this lifespan of the athlete again, right? So we have baseline testing that occurs every year on the outside, we have concussions that occur, we return them to play, we have this post-concussion syndrome concept, we may return them to play, but each patient, we pass through this kind of long-term brain health filter, we call it. And for me, it, it, that, that's the most important thing I do, is step back and look at the bigger picture. Um, as a neurologist, I understand the importance of, of uh, sports to brain health. Um, there are so many, so many things that are, that are a benefit from, from playing sports. And then if you identify yourself growing up playing hockey or soccer or skiing or whatever it is, I'm a hockey player, I'm a soccer player, um, that becomes not only you know, your hobby and, and, and what you like to do, but it becomes an identity thing. Um, it's how you see yourself. Um, and so you know, I hear too often um, just people making these kind of knee-jerk decisions about, oh, stop playing because you've had three. Oh, we don't want that fourth one because something bad's gonna happen. Um, and then, so they end up not playing. And then they come to my clinic a few months later uh, with headaches and they can't sleep and they're depressed and their grades are crap. And you're like, all right, um, I'm pretty sure I know why that is. Let's get you playing hockey again. And sure enough, like nine times out of 10, uh, it was the, the, the removal from sport that people didn't take seriously as what that means. Um, and so that's, that's something that we all, every patient we, we talk to, um, we have that conversation, um, you know, I would say even, even in the high school ages, we're, we're talking to them about, all right, well, what happens when you're not playing hockey? 
um, meaning, meaning when you finally leave the sport, what's your plan? So a lot of our patients, yep, they're just going to go to college and they're good. But a lot of patients are like, yeah, I'm going to try to go pro and play in college. I want this, that's this big career. And, and I know a lot of our players in Michigan, obviously, youth players have that dream. Um, we always talk about, well, you know, there's going to be a transition at some point out of hockey and that's going to be hard. Um, so let's prepare for that. But as I'm sure you're all aware, the big elephant in the room um, is this concept of CTE, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, right? Um, again, was not discovered in 2008, like a lot of people think it was, or whenever um, uh, Dr. Malu kind of came out with his, his paper or whatever. Uh, that, that was, again, it's sort of a discovery of, of risk and, and that kind of a thing. Um, uh, completely misunderstood, misrepresented in the media and, and frankly in medicine too. Uh, CTE, as, as there on the left, um, is really a pathological finding. It is what a brain looks like. On the right side of that square um, is a brain with sort of classic CTE findings and the left is sort of normal brain. Um, however, there's a difference between what tissue looks like uh, under a microscope and what is, what is it doing to the person. Um, and the, on the right there, we have a term traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, which uh, people really should be talking about more. That's the thing that's happening to the person, memory, mood issues, the things that happen later in life. The problem with this conversation, one of the many problems is uh, CTE, um, basically, you know, any amount of, of that tau deposition, that brown stuff in the, in the brain there, any amount that's found in the brain is like, okay, labeled CTE, oh my gosh, you know, but the reality is that if you show, um, uh, you know, pathology slides to a, a room full of pathologists randomly selected, you know, uh, a lot of the, this stuff shows up for a lot of other reasons too. Um, and, it's, and it's with, only with the addition of the history, oh, this was an NHL player, this was a boxer, this was whatever, oh, this must be trauma related. Where, where it's not, it's, it's just simply not that easy. Um, so for me, you know, when I'm counseling and yeah, we, we do this in our youth hockey players and all the time. It's like, you know, oh, we really want, you know, uh, her to play hockey and, um, you know, but, you know, her brain's more important and um, we're worried about concussions and what about CTE and all these things. One of the things to remember, and, and I'll, I will give you, uh, CTE is a real thing. You know, it does happen. Um, the pathological changes with repetitive hits and the sort of, you know, dementing progressive problem later in life does happen. Um, I've seen it in my clinic, we still see it um, too often, I would say. Um, however, uh, the scope of the problem, again, is misunderstood and misrepresented. Um, if we look at the population that's been studied the most, that would be NFL players, former NFL players specifically. Um, there's a group that was studied, these are guys that played from like the mid 60s to the mid 80s. So back when the sport was much more, you know, physical, barbaric, penalties were terrible. Uh, more hitting for sure. People, you know, played injured all the time. Um, that group uh, back then, it was a five years in the NFL. You were fully pensioned. If you're fully pensioned, you were enrolled in the study. The study um, that was conducted by NIOSH uh, followed this group of guys, like 4,000 guys or so, um, over time. They followed them from mainly like mid 90s when they started really looking at them to about 2008, right before this whole thing changed. And this population was looked at for all kinds of stuff, blood pressure, diabetes, drinking, whatever. Um, and they started reporting on, on you know, causes of death, diseases seen in, in people as they died and came to the conclusion, um, a very, very solid data-driven conclusion that there was a risk, if you played in the NFL in that time period, five years or more, um, you were at an increased risk of having a dementing illness. Um, and think of that as Alzheimer's or any other type of dementia, but uh, threefold risk in general, depending on the age. And that got the headlines. And that was part of the, oh my gosh, I don't know if you're killing people. Oh, what are you doing? Like, it's terrible. And it is terrible, don't get me wrong. And the threefold risk is a real risk. Um, but what people don't then stop and tell you is that, well, that means the risk went from 2% to 6%. So if the story is that 94% of NFL players from the 60s to the 80s are fine, neurologically speaking, that's, you're not gonna make a movie about that. You're not gonna make a career scaring people about that or, or telling them about that, right? Um, and so real problem, however, not as common as people realize. 
If you have a primary relative with dementia, your risk goes from 2% to anywhere from 15 to 25%. So, you know, everybody's focused on the sports and the football and all that, you know, but well, family history is probably much more important. And so when I'm counseling, you know, athletes in our clinic in real time, family history is super, super important in, in this way. Um, I, I know that's something that, you know, you guys aren't gonna have to deal with obviously day to day in, in hockey, but yeah, it, it comes up all the time, obviously, is, you know, when do I stop playing and e even recruiting people to play sports like this anymore. Although Michigan hockey is not, not a hard, hard sell. Um, uh, I just wanted to point that out that it's not as big of an issue as people, uh, people seem to think it is. Um, and then finally, and then open up for some questions here. Um, you know, this long-term brain health concept, like I said, uh, is an opportunity to monitor for ongoing symptoms that is more, more than about just playing sports. It's about quality of life. It's about um, uh, grades and social uh, success and all that stuff. I, I mentioned family history is super important. And we, we talk about what we call the health quotient of sports, meaning I've hinted at this already, right? There's an incredible positive from playing sports. What is that versus what are some of the negatives? Um, and I would say across the board that um, people focus way too much on the negatives and don't even consider the positives when, when they're making these long-term decisions. At the same time, I always wanna make sure that my, my contact sport athletes are playing contact sports for the right reasons. Uh, they love the sport, um, you know, it provides good things and not because, you know, expectations of the parents or whatever. So we always talk about kind of, let's make sure we're playing the sports that we want to play. Um, annual dose of force is important. And what I mean by that is in this area of medicine, obviously there are a lot of unknowns. One of them is, well, how, how many hits are too many hits? And the answer is nobody knows. Um, however, I like to practice what I, what I refer to, and maybe you've heard this term, evidence-based medicine, right? Um, it's all over the media, obviously, regarding COVID, but there's, you know, evidence-based medicine is great. When we have evidence, science is science, go. However, um, when you don't have all the evidence, there's still something called common sense. And so for me, I practice evidence-based, common sense, fortified medicine, meaning I can't tell you how many hits is too many, but I'm pretty sure a brain would rather not play football, then play hockey, then play rugby, then play football, then play hockey. <laughs> so, you know, um, we're always counseling people to, you know, uh, if you're playing multiple sports, for example, let's not play multiple contact sports. Um, if it's a football analogy, um, you know, in some of your smaller schools, a lot of kids play both, both directions, right? There's linebacker and running back. Like, All right, well, let's pick a side. Um, just common sense stuff makes sense, as well as what does the future hold, right? So if I've got somebody who maybe has some concerns, having some headaches or some issues, and they're not sure if they want to keep playing hockey, and they've got one more year at Concordia, versus, you know, they're at the University of Wisconsin and they're drafted, um, the future is different. The future exposure to force is different. So in the Concordia example, they've got one more season of, of college hockey. And another example, they've got many, many years, hopefully, of NHL hockey. So understanding what's in the future for people makes um, these decisions more complex as well. Uh, that's that future exposure risk. And then, you know, the retirement decision I talked about, like we always uh, kind of bring that up in one way or another to get people prepared for it um, and to really get them to start thinking out, outside of kind of what's right in front of them. Um, and then obviously we're, we're educating and planning with, with our patients every time we, we, we come in contact with them. So um, that's what I wanted to present today. And this is, um, like I said, a great opportunity. Uh, I'm super, super happy to address the group. Um, I, I'm sorry if uh, you came to this talk hoping that I would clarify some things and make it simple. I, hopefully I clarified some things and just gave you a sense of the, the bigger issues that we're dealing with out there uh, in, in the world. Um, as I mentioned, and I think Jason so mentioned too, so um, the Cutcher Clinic, our, our home base is in Brighton, um, right off of 96 there on, on Grand River. Um, I have a, a clinic though with Henry Ford uh, down at downtown at the Pistons Performance Center um, that I'm at every week at, at some point. And then we have our, our, our Western clinic is out in Park City, Utah, and I fly back there every once a month or so, but um, we're always doing telehealth back and forth. And so one of the things that I really wanna stress is getting into see us should be super easy. I've got staff, we've got people always um, uh, who can get people in quickly, uh, do physical in-person visits if we can, telehealth if we can't, just to get things going in the right direction. 
Um, to me, that's, that's one of the things that we really, really need to focus on is getting the diagnosis right, managing these patients accurately, um, getting them back to play because it's super important, uh, but doing so in, a, in an efficient and healthy manner. So um, with that, you know, I'll leave it there and uh, see if you guys have any questions or comments or anything else. Once again, first off, uh, Dr. Kutcher, thank you so much for, for taking the time to give us this presentation. This is, uh, this is much better than, our, than our, our standard concussion protocol presentations and things of that sort. It's certainly, certainly much, uh, much more detailed, and I, and I can't thank you enough for this content. Um, once again, if anybody has any questions for Dr. Kutcher, feel free to um, just to share your, or excuse me, just to uh, turn your camera on and I can go one by one and, um, and, and allow folks to, to chime in. Dr. Kutcher, one question I wanted to ask is I, you know, I work with um, USA Hockey and its, its Player Safety Committee on some, uh, you know, some of their programs and policies and we share ideas just based on, on things like concussions and things of that sort of, one of the things we're talking about right now is trying to come up with some sort of effective way to provide data to either to USA Hockey or, um, or even just to have data on hand as a, as a, a local affiliate, as a governing body here for incidents that we get over the course of, of the year. I guess we're trying to understand maybe at, at different age groups, how, you know, how often concussions are prevalent. Um, but, you know, maybe that's something that we can use to examine, you know, and examine potential rule changes or policies that, that we need to put in place. But I guess the, the, question, the question is what sort of what sort of data do we would we have to try to capture in order to make that information relevant? It's one thing to say, hey, somebody got hit. We think it's a concussion. We went through the protocol. They returned to, you know, they returned to play. And so you have that, that one incident. But I, I suspect because every, every case is a little bit different, what, what, what's some of the relevant information or data that we as a as a governing body should could, should consider trying to capture? And do we need to work with the doctor on identifying those things? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a lot you can do. Um, a, lot, a lot of things that you could collect that would be helpful. So one of the things I would think about, because um, you, you mentioned rules changes or, you know, is, is yeah, uh, keep track of concussion diagnoses best you can. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that should, be relatively straightforward based on, you know, they went into a protocol, they came back, that kind of a thing. Um, the, the less uh, easy, but I, I think equally important would be, well, how many times were they pulled and evaluated as, as the bigger number? Mm -hmm. What percent of those were diagnosed with concussion? Of those concussions, what were the mechanisms? Um, and what was the duration of, of the process before return to play in each of those diagnosed concussions? Um, in, in a general sense, I'll give you some, just some data examples. Um, I, I have found over the years that I would, I would be comfortable if we were just on average evaluating twice as many people as were being diagnosed, just a mm -hmm. general concept. And that's, in the NBA, actually, that's pretty darn accurate almost every year. We'll have maybe a little bit more. We'll have like 30 some diagnosed concussions. We'll do like 75 evals per season, something like that. Um, the NHL data is roughly similar as far as like number of evaluations versus number of diagnosed concussions. And to me, what that means is we're, we, we want to be, you know, kind of capturing a larger population. We don't want to get crazy about it. We don't want to be doing 3,000 evaluations for 10 diagnoses. Sure. But we don't want to be doing 50 you know, evaluations for 49 diagnoses either. That means you're probably missing some. So getting data on how many kids are being pulled and evaluated, um, like I said, that, that would be helpful. From the mechanism perspective, um, you know, we don't want to get too crazy with it. Um, meaning, again, at the initial level, we've had conversations about, um, you know, the outcomes from a hit, shoulder to head, head hits the board versus shoulder to head, head hits the ice, like crazy stuff. Like, no, the brain doesn't know which immovable object it just hit, right? The ice and the boards are equally hard. Um, but as far as, um, when it comes to safety issues, 
what, what is the general play? Is this open ice, right? Um, is this something in the corner? Um, and I can tell you based on, on, on you know, knowing the sport in, from NHL and college, uh, the vast majority of concussions, as you can imagine, happen in the corners and, and it's defensemen in the defensive zone. Mm -hmm. It's still probably the biggest, if you look at a map of the ice where these injuries occur, that's where they occur the most. Um, and yeah, so we've already, you know, changed some of the icing rules over time and done things to help that out. But um, so tracking mechanism, location on the ice, um, was it, you know, uh, clean body check, headshot, um, you know, even, even a cross check scenario, puck to the head. Just keeping a general list of that kind of stuff would, would be helpful for sure. Um, yeah, those are some of my initial thoughts. Okay, great stuff, great stuff. Uh, once again, final pass, any questions for Dr. Kutcher? Going once, going twice. It's been an easy crowd thus far, Dr. Kutcher, so I, I, I appreciate it. I, I, once again, I, I cannot thank you enough for your, for your time and your support. Um, you know, this has been a tremendous, uh, a tremendous presentation. Again, we, we've recorded this, so we're, we're, we're more than, uh, we're, we're more than excited to share this content with the rest of our, our community uh, and our, our local associations here. And as, as a, as a, a player yourself and somebody who grew up in the game, we're, we're extremely honored to, to have you as a, a part of our community and, and, uh, your, your willingness to participate today is greatly appreciated. I know you're, you've got a lot on your plate these days. So, um, but thank you so much for, for your help. And certainly if there's anything we can do for you, by all means, reach out anytime. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, uh, you know, the honor's mine, like I said, um, love, love doing this. So reach out if I can help in any other way. I appreciate it. Dr. Kutcher, thank you so much. All right, folks, have a great Saturday.